Hello and welcome to the next episode of the podcast Coffee and Come Back. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Neka. I'm going to let Neka introduce herself, but what I will say is Neka is somebody that I met when she was in a, a role in the wealth management industry as a senior director in a role that she's also carrying out now. She's Neka is a senior director in wealth management. Neka is also an NED and somebody that inspires operational excellence and progression and we're going to talk about all of those different things today but Neka over to you please give our listeners introduction into you and who you are and welcome. Thank you Sam really really happy to be here um, and thank you to everyone listening as well. Um, I'm Neka Oji so as Sam said uh, we met uh, probably a couple of years ago now when I was in a wealth management business in a COO role um, and currently now working in more of an advisory capacity. So within a consulting firm, but very much focused on wealth management clients, so assets and wealth management businesses, and really focusing on performance improvement, acquisitions, um, also the broader piece around talent um, and really ensuring that um, the strong talent pipeline. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that later. Um, prior to all of this, I spent 10 years in management consulting. Um, I didn't necessarily think I would uh, work within wealth management when I first started my career, but essentially spent uh, 10 years focused primarily on financial services clients uh, before, uh, I guess, making um, the commitment to stay within wealth management when I moved into industry. So that's a very short uh, intro. Thank you, Neka. I mean, that is a brief introduction to what clearly is a really colourful and successful career. But one of the things we always like to touch on on Coffee and Come Back as well is your, is your journey and some of the challenges that you might have faced along the way and the lessons that you've learned. When I'm asked the question about challenges, I always look back and then I almost find that I'm struggling to find a challenge, even though during the time it does feel like a challenge. But I look back and I think, actually, you know, these are real opportunities that developed me. Um, but I would say initially that, and they were challenges. One was really, I guess, finding my own voice and being comfortable with that because the confidence I have now is definitely not the same level of confidence I had when starting my career. And being able to know who I am and also find a voice in which I could still demonstrate my authentic values and my um, the, the, the way I'd want to have my career and progress my career. I think that was something that was initially a challenge, but I'm really pleased I have gotten to that point because I feel like I can now be an authentic leader. So that's one thing that I'm sure we'll um, work through in a bit more detail. I think the second area is also making sure that um, this idea of work-life balance and really making sure that I'm clear about, you know, my version of work-life balance is definitely not the same as anyone else's. Um, but finding something that works and is sustainable because I, I do fall into the bucket of probably workaholic, um, unfortunately. So it's <laughs> trying to find um, something that um, is sustainable in the long term. So I'd say those are sort of the two significant challenges. And the third is probably one that um, I was lucky and it's a sort of accidental that I was able to find a sponsor in my career um, because I think having that support network and the sponsorship has been so fundamental and I see that as um, a bit of a challenge when I speak to lots of my mentees um, on that side of things. Yeah and, and they're very real challenges aren't they that a lot of us face and go back to the the first point that you you made and the challenge around finding your voice yeah. and really being clear on who you are we hear that a lot and I can completely empathise with that. And I guess what would be really interesting to explore is what steps did you need to go through to to really get to that point? Obviously, there's an element mm. of experience and maturity and, you know, through lived experience, we grow as people. So, you know, our experiences shape us. But are there sort of steps that you, in hindsight, maybe or at the time identified that you needed to go through to, to reach that mm. point? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And the thing I would say as well is that, you know, um, we're always changing. So what I found worked maybe five years into my career definitely wasn't working, I don't know, three years ago. So I think it's um, it's definitely a, 
uh, work in progress and in the evolution. Um, but I think the first thing I would say is I really did surround myself with people who supported me, who were able to challenge me effectively, but also um, highlight the strengths I had. So um, very early on in my career, and I've talked about this before, I think I even posted about it, um, my very first uh, sort of performance review um, the, I remember the senior manager at the time saying to me, you know, you just need to look at those two guys over there. You know, that's what confidence looks like. That's what you need to aim for. And I just remember thinking, I know that I will never be those two guys. They were constantly going out with the very senior MPs, getting completely drunk every night. And I just thought, this is not me and it's not ever going to be me. Um, I can have fun, but not in that same way. And so what I realized then is one cultural fit was not going to work for me within that specific environment. Um, but also that I was very clear knowing that, okay, if I don't fit into a certain um, group, that there are other networks and other support um, groups that I'd need to lean into and lean on um, to make sure I didn't feel completely excluded. Um, and yeah, just everyone wants to feel like they have this sort of this squad and their family and so on. So I think it was being very intentional about finding groups within organizations that I could lean on and also externally. Um, I, I'm really, really lucky that I have a really strong family um, support system and also friends that I've even friends from my very first day at work 13 years ago I still you know we go traveling together and we um, still meet each other for catch up so I think that was me finding people who's uh, who I shared the same values with and they aren't always the loudest people in the room and I think that can be quite disorienting when you're much more junior in your career but also throughout just finding maybe sometimes the quieter voices but people who are you share that same level of integrity and so on with. And um, yeah, so that was um, one of the first things I did. So I tapped into lots of networks, the multicultural network, um, because I really do think there's something about working and being make, developing friendships with people who have that multicultural perspective, um, the women's networks and lots of other networks that I joined. So that was definitely the first thing. But if I almost fast forward, um to probably about three years ago um one of the things that I definitely needed to help me not just find my voice but to be able to communicate in a way that was still effective as a more senior leader I then engaged in an exec with an executive coach and I think again not everyone is you know a proponent of coaching but I I definitely think if you find the like right coach you have the right chemistry fit um, it was actually pivotal in terms of me being able to hold the mirror up and say, actually, yes, you can still be your true self. You can still have your voice, but you might need to shape things slightly differently to land the message to take a team forward. Um, so those would be um, some of the things I've done. I should also say that um, as part of that, I mentioned earlier the sponsorship side, but I think if you work with leaders who see who you are, appreciate who you are. Yes, you might challenge them a bit because I think in many ways I was challenging the status quo going into the city um, with most, in professional services, the most senior leaders don't look like me. So I was lucky enough to work with um, partners at my, one of the firms I worked at um, who really gave me the space to be myself and encouraged me. Yes, it was challenging, it's never easy. Someone can give you a platform but you still need to have those conversations that can be quite difficult. So, um, yes, I did all of the above. Some of the things worked uh, more effectively than others. But, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's really a journey and figuring it out as you go, but making sure you've got people around you who can support you on that journey. Absolutely. And, and like you say, part of that journey is that self-awareness element, but also it is very environmental. And actually leadership is really fundamental to how you develop particular well at any stage of your career actually yeah. but you know leadership is all around us in terms of good examples and bad examples yeah. of leadership and what feels to one person that is bad leadership might be good to another so it's really quite subjective yeah. and you know even when you're studying leadership as I've been recently MBA for example if you're you know 
as you know, I was in the military and there's a, a yeah. big sort of push on leadership development and everything else. There's still lots of debate around the difference between what is good leadership, what even is the definition yeah. of leadership. But ultimately, I believe, and it's obviously, you know, it's world according to Sam, so it's not necessarily right or wrong. Yeah. It's definitely opinion, but it's about a set of behaviours. And, and those behaviours sometimes do need to change according to the environment, according to the team that you might be working with or for. And so it can be really, um, yeah, it can be really pivotal in what you're doing. It sounds like you yeah. had some some really key touch points with some leadership roles as, as you were finding your voice. Are there any particular yeah. moments or elements of that that spring to mind that helped you just create more of that self-awareness alongside the coaching element? Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things you raised a good point about self awareness. I think that one of the things that really helped me was um, going through some 360 feedback and also um, some of things like the Hogan Strength Assessment and so on. Because I think there's something around having a bit more of an objective. They will never give you 100% accurate answers or profiles, but they do give you insights that I think you can then use and take to, into conversations either with managers or sponsors or mentors or whoever to say actually, what do you think this actually means? How do I maybe lean in on my strengths? How do I maybe um, address some of the development areas and so on? So I think um, in terms of a practical tool, I definitely found the sort of insight Hogan piece really helpful to do every couple of years just to see actually how am I changing? How, what do I need in the wider team I'm developing to make sure that together collectively we can achieve what we're aiming to achieve? But in terms of, um, in terms of a specific moment, um, a couple come to mind. I remember I was on a, a client project. Um, we were sort of between Johannesburg and Dubai and, uh, we were in a team that was, um, I was the only uh, woman in the team, the most junior, and I had been given a certain role to deliver. Um, but what I found over the course of the first couple of weeks is that I was sort of being undermined and given, um, rather than a process lead role and, you know, leading uh, and facilitating workshops with the client, I was sort of being asked to book the um, hotel and dinner reservations and so on. And all of those things were value add, but they weren't the reason that I was sort of flying to Johannesburg for three weeks and not being with family and so on. So um, there were some very challenging conversations I had to have with senior manager because there were other things that were done. The client would walk into the meeting room, the other sort of eight to 10 members of the team would be introduced and I was literally skipped over. And I don't think I've ever felt invisible. You can feel um, sometimes that maybe you're undervalued, but to actually feel invisible, that was the first time for me. And um, I think that was a bit shocking because I was probably three months into the firm I had just joined and maybe in second year of my career. Um, so I sat down with the senior manager and these conversations are always awkward. No one ever wants to go and be confrontational. But at the end of the day, I'm not someone who likes to carry things around with me and then sort of talk behind someone's back and not actually address the issue head on. I my personal approach is that it doesn't um, tend to resolve anything. So um, I basically ended up asking to leave the engagement, which is definitely not the done thing. Um, and I came back to the London office and I thought that people, you know, would, uh, the senior partners would understand my side of the story and why I felt, you know, that this wasn't what I signed up for. But I was really shocked to see the reaction where, at the end of the day, every business has a very commercial lean, and I think the view was, you know, potentially losing the firm revenue and so on. Having said all of that, so it was a very challenging time. I didn't feel like I had necessarily built the support network within the firm because it was still early on. But what was really helpful is that I stayed true to myself, and actually, I think two weeks later, there was another partner who I had sort of shared my experiences with and an opportunity came up with a client um, and I ended up that ended up being the piece of work that I led and actually um, it, because I was able to sell that piece of work sell on further pieces of work it actually gave me an accelerated promotion within the firm 
Um, and I was able to define a space and create something that I could be um, proud of and also look at myself in the mirror and know that I hadn't, you know, lost my myself or my integrity within that process. So um, that's just one example where I found actually, you know, doing things, facing things head on sometimes um, can be very uh, effective and helpful. And even though it's painful at the time, actually it could open doors further down. Yeah, definitely. And there's a really good message there, isn't there, about staying true to yourself. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't always give you the immediate outcome that's easy to deal with yeah. or, the, or the people around you, but actually in the long term. And it sounds as though, you know, you were, you were brave, you stood true to your values, something I know that you do, in, yeah. you know, in your everyday life, you have an incredible work ethic. And I think that just you know it holds true to who you are doesn't it and when you're leading yeah. people as well and people are looking up to you you know as you are as a as a director in a business somebody in a yeah. business that's role modeling behaviors that's really important isn't it um and, yeah. and when you've been consulting i sort of slightly off the beaten track but what yeah. goes through my mind is is that the sort of thing that comes out when you're looking at businesses or or teams how much do you feel really comes down to those leadership behaviours and the and the role modelling mm. in terms of determinant of either success or not? Mm. Um, yeah. You know what? I, I really do think that leadership is sort of, it's maybe um, misunderstood, or at least from my perspective. I think being a leader is extremely hard. It's I would say it's one of the hardest things to do within a business setting. I don't think, because everyone sort of, you want to get your promotion, you want to progress, everyone wants to climb up the ladder, but I don't think the full weight and um, the, the importance and the challenge of being a leader is fully understood. At least for me, it wasn't. Um, I thought, you know, Yes, be yourself, work hard, do the right thing. But actually, it's never that straightforward. And I think as, in an advisory capacity, what we definitely see is because in many ways, we're brought on by leaders to help them deliver, whether it's an initiative, a full business transformation, and it's to make them successful. And, you know, you can see some very effective leaders when it comes to running day-to-day -day operations or um, inspiring teams who aren't sometimes able to make that shift within a business, um, maybe a more strategic shift and you see people sort of being sidelined. So I think from my standpoint, I can never say, I think it's the point you made earlier, you know, these five traits make an extremely successful leader. The context within which you're operating, look at what's happened in the past three years. Actually, leadership has been tested in so many ways. So I feel that um, to be a good leader, at least... For me, what I, trait, uh, I aim to do, and I take a lot um, of inspiration from leaders I found inspiring. Um, but I think one is, yeah, staying true to yourself, but being really honest and um, communicating. I think being able to communicate and not try to pull the wool over people's eyes, or even if it's coming from a place of compassion. And I think there's a level of honesty that's needed in communication that I don't always see. So I think being saying what you mean and actually acting on what you mean. There's when I see leaders who are disingenuous, for me it just I I I struggle to um maintain respect for them. This sounds pretty harsh, but I'm I'm just being candid. I think that being a leader, we can't sit on that side and say, Oh, that person's not doing this and that person. It's a hard job, but there are a few things that I think at least you can maintain respect across your team and credibility. I think that's the main thing, whether it leads to, I don't know, transformational success, cost-effective businesses. Actually, those things are, yes, ideally what would happen, but true leaders don't necessarily always deliver on, on those things, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I can totally concur with your comment around the loss of respect when someone goes against your values and again it's very personal isn't it so yeah. there will be elements that can really then just change your perception of somebody in an instant you know the whole element of it takes a long time to build trust in a relationship but it can yeah. be lost in an instant if there is something yeah. that 
you know blatantly goes against your values and yeah. um you know that also that good leadership element then it's just if you're being honest and authentic then yeah. normally it's difficult to be fa- to find yourself in in that space yeah. um yeah. I want to touch on something you mentioned earlier about saying you're working a lot in financial services um particularly a consultant in the city and you made a comment along the lines of nobody else looked like me mm-hmm. could we just expand on that a bit and I guess my own experience of that would be more as a female in yeah. a room sometimes the only female often yeah. the only female um obviously there's an addition for you in terms yeah. of of your your background your race and do you still feel that and I, I'm really interested to know how do you find the strength to keep pushing forward and is it building that network and I just want to as you say just be really mm. honest and upfront about how it feels for you because mm. you know I need to be aware we all need to be aware mm. are we part of the problem mm. are there things we could or should be doing so that you don't walk into a room and feel even if we don't look the same that doesn't mean I don't belong mm. here yeah yeah, I think um, that's a really uh, meaty subject, um, but I'll try to share my perspective. And I definitely, um, as a black woman, I'm sharing my personal experiences. It's not the case for every black woman, um, obviously. Um, so I always try to highlight where I've been really lucky and privileged um, because I think when the topic of pri- privilege, white privilege, social mobility privilege comes up, it can, people start to say, well, you didn't get this and, you know, you have to want, it's almost this competition of how privileged or underprivileged people are. So I try to start from there to say, yes, I am a black woman. If you walk into the city, in most senior ro- in most rooms of senior people, um, I would be a minority. It's just a fact of the matter. It's not really a debate to be had. Um, however, I'm also very conscious that when I walk into that room, I'm not necessarily going to feel the same as a black woman who maybe has had less um, access to specific. Um, so I went to a very elite private school, the secondary school. Um, I went to Oxford University, there's certain privileges that that comes with. And some of those privileges are just as subtle as having confidence to face up to certain people. So me walking into on my first day of post-graduation and um, walking into the city, yes, I noticed that I was in the minority, but actually the previous, I don't know, 20 years, I had always been the minority in the room, whether it was in um, the all girls school I went to. I was one of, I think, I don't know, I want to say the percentage was 1% black representation at the school. Um, at Oxford, uh, at the time, 2006-2010, again, the representation of black students was 1% of the university. So actually, going into the city, I, I think the representation at the time in senior roles was probably about 3%, 4%. I'm not sure the exact stat. So I don't want to say that it was a shock to the system it's never ideal when you walk in and you know especially if people are sort of surprised to see you there or um make you feel unwelcome but I just think it's important to give that context because um and this uh, really came to light to me when I was mentoring um one of with um through the social mobility foundation and my very first mentee I remember working with her she was just coming through um university she had just applied to university um, and we worked through so many different things, confidence and so on. And she did really well, um, got onto the civil service fast track. You know, it's so competitive to get onto that program. And she had come from um, a more challenging socioeconomic environment. And she said, oh, I don't think I can survive this. I, you know, there's some real issues that I'm facing, whether I, it's how I speak, it's how um, I go about things. I just feel like an outsider. And I kept saying, no, it's fine. because." In my mind, yes, I felt like an outsider too, but, you know, you can navigate it and it's not that bad and so on and so forth. But actually what she was saying, I didn't face those specific challenges in terms of 
I didn't go to a certain university, I didn't go to a certain type of school. And I think that her experience is very different to mine. But like you said, we can definitely learn from each other. And I think that's really um, one of the things that I'm um, trying to do a lot more through mentoring is really understand the perspective of the individual and what can be done. But I, coming back to my journey, I feel like, um, yes, it's, it's not ideal when I walk into a room and I'm the only black woman. And to be honest, a lot of the time it will be, to your point, still one of the only women, regardless of um, ethnicity. But at the same time, um, it's not it's not ideal mainly because I know that, that it's because of the lack of access to many people. It's not just because it would be nice to have other people who look like me. It fundamentally this means that people don't have access the same level of access that we might all want to have so I I definitely think it still doesn't feel 100% comfortable but um it's something that I've become very used to but I'm actively working to change that because I think it can have huge um it can really influence huge um a community so the black community and when we look at um generational wealth and so on and so forth actually it's so small things if you walk into a room and you're still a minority it's representative of the access people have to wealth towards the future uh, for future generations as well so um i've touched on a few things there but i would say that's now how i i see it so i, I never expect to be in the majority when i walk into the room no and there was a lot going through my mind when you were speaking obviously there are lots of yeah. routes we can we yeah. can go down with what you touched on there but in terms of bringing it into where you've already gone with that conversation it sounds as though the network element and the mentoring element has been really quite fundamental as both mentee and mentor. Mm. And I know you've already touched on coaching, but how would you describe, um, you know, for our listeners in terms of where you see the power of mentoring and how that can be part of the change, how we can be part of the change by having mentors that are able to empathize and support what could that look like and even if we're not mentors what could we be doing to be part of the change and not part of of the problem yeah I think that um it's funny actually I was saying I went to um, a mentoring event yesterday as part of women of color global network um and the the founders actually started the initiative because they had been very successful in the media and publications and publish, pu- publishing even, and um, they were both women of colour but had never had mentors as women of colour. So they had set up this programme. And um, I guess for a lot of us um, as women of colour, we were saying that, you know, it would be great to be able to see people ahead of us who looked like us. But what was also evident in the room is that lots of people had had mentors who were just either not women or were white male mentors and I've definitely benefited from having white male sponsors um I've never had a formal mentor until about six weeks ago I've had different people I've sought advice from but um I have a really successful um uh white woman who's going to be my um mentor and I think just even in our first conversation it was just great to see we yes we all we look different but actually we had very shared experiences um, she had come from um, a multicultural or um, different, her parents are of different, uh, from different countries. She had lived in lots of different countries growing up and so on. So there's a lot of shared um, experiences and commonalities. Um, but I think it's, again, coming back to the individual. Yes, we should all, I think everyone should be mentoring because it's, uh, I know now there's a sort of reverse mentoring and co-mentoring, but I think mentoring in itself is always two way. Um, and so I think that there's real value for everyone to mentor and to learn about people's lived experiences because you can read as many books as you want, you can go to as many um, events on um, allyship and inclusion and all of those things are great, but I think being able to really empathise and understand someone else's story makes a huge difference and the more exposed you are to other people's stories, the more likely you are to be able to empathise and then to take meaningful action off the back of that empathy because sort of being empathetic is great, but it doesn't necessarily drive um, 
the conversation. So whether it's in the promotion panels or whatever it might be, if someone's described as, oh, she, she looks angry, which is sort of the typical angry black woman um, definition, then actually it's delving into the, actually what does that actually mean? Why are we using that as a reference point when it comes to performance and promotion? Um, so I think there's a lot that can be done, but it starts with getting to really understand individuals and communities. Um, and I say this knowing that I also need to be a lot more intentional about the communities I engage with because I, I left school and moved to London and university. And I, I did think actually I really want to expose myself um, to other communities. And that's why I started as a school governor um, and also um, within these mentoring programs because they just give you insights that you would never think of if you lived sort of in your own bubble because we all live in our own bubbles really um so yeah that's what um absolutely yeah, yeah which is amazing because like you say we have we all have unconscious bias yeah fact um so some of it is about just making those biases more conscious so that we yeah. can like you say be more intentional and aware and I think and I'd really like to move this into the sort of social mobility and financial um, inclusion side of things. Yeah. I, I know you're aware that for me, social mobility is really important. And that means, as you say, it's not just about equal distribution of, of wealth and looking at mm. actually providing, it's more about access and allowing people to be in that room. And, you know, I've been there with the imposter syndrome, which I won't delve into today, but I spoke about it on other podcasts. You know, I'm there at Sandhurst, surrounded by people that have been to, you know, mm. Red Brick Universities. And, you know, I grew up on a council estate, joined the army at 16, worked my way through the ranks. And there I'm, I'm there with all these graduates and sort of wealthy people. And you feel, oh, mm. should I even be here? And you think, yes, mm. I should. I should have the opportunities. And if I'm capable, as capable yeah. as you are, I can't help where I came from, but I can yeah. change where where I end up. And it's a line that I use a lot. And I think providing access and not being so judgmental because you haven't been to a certain school, actually that should give us the impetus to say, Right, okay, what can we unlock? And I think that's really important. But come back to the financial side of things. And I think I mentioned to you before we came on, I was at an event last night and I introduced myself as a financial feminist, which I have never uh -huh. done before. But I was really yeah. trying to summarize what is the message I want to um, convey. And I do genuinely believe, and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about stats, but yeah. they are staggering. Yeah. Whether you look at the pension gap, the investment gap, you know, women, we in general, and this is generalising, and unfortunately yeah. statistics do that, but they do paint a picture where we look at women, where we're saying over 60% of the wealth in the UK will be in women's hands in the next few years, yet oh, well over half of them have never invested. Well over half of them would end up with a pension pot, a fifth of the size of of the mayor equivalent because they would have mm -hmm. shouldered some of the child care and burdens or they might not have had access to some of the roles and all of these elements around it yet often through education and exposure women can start to feel that financial confidence mm -hmm. and start to take more control of their own finances what what's your view on that and you know, I know you've done quite a bit of research on this it's something you're heavily involved mm -hmm. in but what are some yeah. key areas that you'd share with us that you think we could all be more mindful of and take action on? Yeah. Yeah, I think what's been really good to see over the past few years is that the discussion around financial education and just money has definitely increased. I think awareness is going up, which is great. I think the advice gap in the UK is still, like you said, staggering. Um, I think over 20 million people say that they don't, they would like to invest, they would like to save, but they just don't feel they have access to the information to do so. Um, and I think that this is where um, we all need to actively play a part. And I think financial institutions have an even bigger role and responsibility to make those changes. If we look at women, as uh, you were saying, um, in terms of pension gap, in terms of investing itself, 28% of men between the ages of 18 and 35 are investing and that compared to 14 percent of women in that same um, age group and we need to ask ourselves why is that because women are just as able they're becoming 
the sort of term of breadwinners, but high earners as well. And even if it's not a high earner, they are progressing in their careers. They're actually having more accountability and ownership over their wealth and their earnings. Why is it that they aren't they then actually taking steps to invest? And I think that there are a couple of things, and actually we'll be exploring some of this in the paper that we're writing um, and an event that we're hosting as part of International Women's Day. Um, but really, it comes down to a couple of things. I think one is education and starting that as early as possible. Um, it's similar to sort of STEM and what we saw, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, where um, the uptake of STEM across women was much lower. But we've seen huge progress on that. And now, actually, I think it's, if it's not slightly um, surpassed, women are actually doing a lot more STEM subjects. And I think that's what, when it comes to money and financial matters, it matters for all children, but making sure that we don't use language that might um, put um, small um, girls off. And again, like you say, generalization, but I think that it's important that no one's excluded in the conversation. They're starting early on, and it's good to see what some of the banks are doing in terms of saving back. There was a podcast I was listening to the other day where people were talking about, you know, having the old piggy bank, and now people are having sort of cash cards at a really young age and whether that's good or bad but I, I think the fact that we're actually talking to them about to children about money and saying if you're spending what does it mean what does it mean to save rather than spend currently and so on so I think that's important um I think the when it comes to um sort of the language that's used um and also interestingly 16 percent of financial advisors are women according to the FCA some women will feel more comfortable going to female advisors because they want to talk about different things that matter more to them. And actually, we don't have enough financial advisors who are women. And this, again, comes down to um, the organisations, so those big firms that are, whether they've got academies or they've, they're train, they've got training programmes for advisors, being very active in terms of and intentional in their recruitment to attract female advisors who... Well, I think we'll play an important part in terms of closing the gap when it comes to women and investing. So there are a few things that I think we we need to do when it comes to education, language, and including women in the conversation. Um, when if your your client is um a man who has um a female wife, like actually include that woman in the conversation. Don't just have the one to one conversation. So there are lots of things that I think can be done. Um, but um, it takes some time uh, to see the progress. It does, but I, I do feel like as a you know as a woman in finance and in that environment at the moment, it is definitely changing. But it was interesting. One, I was at an event last night actually, and I got talking to a lady there who used to be in consulting, but actually, but now she is um, very heavily in, involved in startups and investing. Mm -hmm. And she spoke to me about some work she did with a particular financial advice firm I said what was staggering was we then decided to work with them and we went into a meeting and it was to do with investments and she felt like she was completely overlooked even though she was the high runner um, which in many ways should be irrele irrelevant if you're walking mm. into the room with an advisor as a couple as a team you are both there equally and you know it's about treating those people in front of you equally and I think to still hear stories where women feel like they're sort of you know you're addressing your conversation to the man of the house you know it's sort of mm. it's not a, it's not a good space for us to be in while some people might have personal preference and this would be my message for for women the only way to to understand is to educate is to just find out a bit more about it. Go and be in the room, go and be part of the conversation because you absolutely are good enough. And what's really interesting, I love this term, women are not risk averse in general, they're more risk aware. They tend to take more calculated risks. They tend to be yeah. a bit more mindful and considered about the risks that they're taking just through the nature of being a woman, the different hormones and everything that, that comes with that. Actually, there's a lot of research out there that shows, and I won't quote specific numbers because I don't have the, the sort of credits to give out on that, but mm. it's over 2% roughly that you see outperformance of female investors, whether that's personal investing or whether that's in 
you know, yeah. professional investment management. I don't think that should be overlooked. And I think no. it would be a taboo to say that. We should be we should be proud of that. Yeah, um, there was another um, report that came out because you were talking about actually decision making. Um, I think it was the UBS um, Own Your Worth report. And in that report, seven in 10 men and five in 10 women said that the men still took um, the lead decision making role when it came to long term finances um, in, in uh, partnerships. And then um, I think it was another 20% of women and men actually made decisions together about their long term financial situation. So it's quite shocking when you think about, I don't know, any other decision you might make, you might make about your children, about your um, health, um, and so on. And yet, when it comes to long term financial planning, that decision making role is given to just one part of the partnership or one half of the partnership. Um, and I think that um, that if we all take a step back, we'd say that makes no sense because it's such an important part of our long term futures. And so I think this is um, it's something that a, a lot it's a small step, it's a small fix, but can have actually quite a significant um, influence in terms of positively changing um the way women are included in investing decisions 100 percent. and i think it goes back to a message you shared earlier which is about role modeling and when you whether it's walk into a room or turn on a podcast or yeah. whatever it might be that you see that there are other women that are able to you know demonstrate that it's where we should and could be we don't have to prove ourselves just because we're we're women that that shouldn't be yeah. a thing um yeah I'm really keen to move on to the coffee break side of things but before we do that is there anything you'd like to sort of wrap that conversation element up with in terms of going through that journey and taking that and I'm sure we can all look back and go wow I'm so many ways I'm the same in many ways I'm, I'm quite different but mm -hmm. what is different about you know having been on that journey to date with your career and the decisions yeah. you're making, you're now at a senior level in financial services, you're looked to as a role model. Um, how does that feel? What What is different about how you approach your professional role and life now and personal life? I'm sure yeah. they all go hand in hand. Yeah. I think um, there are a few things. I think firstly, the things that haven't changed is that our uh, one, I am still very determined to lead authentically and to be myself. I think that's important to have that as a constant throughout. I think that I have become a lot more comfortable in taking ownership of, I hate this term, the personal brand, but actually defining my brand and not letting other people put labels on me. I think it's a very, um, it's probably one of the most, uh, defining things you can do is to give ownership to someone else to define who you are um, because that tends to then define how you see yourself rather than actually um, in its original form so I think that's something that I've become a lot more confident about doing and you know everyone wants to put people in boxes and define you and I, I find that many people see people as individuals as one-dimensional you can have a fun side you can have a serious side and I think that's um that's definitely something that I've definitely become much more um, comfortable with. I've become much more comfortable as well having those challenging conversations and doing so in a way that is effective, not just sort of ranting, but actually being really clear about making the case for whether it's making the case for change, making the case to um, promote individuals who aren't necessarily spoken up for. I think that's something that... Um, has come as part of that journey. And I think I'm much more committed as well to wealth management, I know we were talking about it, but actually as a tool as a tool to empower people, it's not just about um, you know, retiring at this point. It's actually do you feel like you have ownership around your current circumstances, around the opportunities that you have going forward? There was a stat, another stat I saw, um, I think it was TIAA in the US, they're saying that 54% of African Americans in the US aren't ready, aren't, uh, can't afford to retire. That is, it's shocking because not only are they not ready to retire, they're not able to then pass on wealth to 
the next generation. So when we think about the world and sort of legacy and what we're trying to do, I think it's to leave the world a better place than when we came in. But I think part of that is being able to take ownership of who you are, the tools, and money is a tool to help us progress. Um, so I, I see all of those as um, really important. And I feel just much more committed and clear about what the direction I'm heading in, which I think when you start, at least when I started my career, you're sort of stumbling about saying, oh, I sort of like this. I sort of... But that clarity of purpose has, has definitely come um, much more for me uh, with time. Which is amazing. But I also think, we can be quick to judge when we say, oh, well, you know, they're, they've moved around or that. I think yeah. it's a good thing if yeah. when you're forming your career, you're still working out where your place is, where you want to go. We can and, and by the way, that can change your purpose, yeah. your yeah. aspirations. They yeah. might not be the same today as they were 10 years ago. In fact, they probably yeah. aren't. And, and it's being much more open to the fact that like you say, careers aren't one dimensional anymore. Our lives are not one dimensional. Um, we yeah. maybe could be a bit more accepting about people finding their way and making decisions because we're all human. We yeah. would all make mistakes. We would all make career wrong turns and whatever that might be. But yeah. we tend to be much, much better off for that. So it's not yeah, necessarily a definitely. bad thing, is it? No, exactly. It's, uh, it should be early years of um, anyone's career I think should be exploration exploration finding out what works what doesn't work what keeps you motivated and uh, I should say as well I saw a post on LinkedIn it's not to sort of discount those who actually need core jobs and we all have bills to pay and so on so that's important but finding um, whether it's a hobby or finding something that will give you the chance to explore and this is again why it's so important when it comes to financial planning being able to give people more choice and more options um uh, and freedom to do what it is that they actually um, care about yeah and I think choice is a really important element there because through empowerment through knowledge and being able to do the right things rather than seeing wealth as wealth for the wealthy and what does wealthy yeah. mean anyway one person's yeah. wealth is 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 not for the other so it's actually yeah me about financial security and financial security means you can sleep at night means you have a roof over your head means you've got a way to move forward rather than living in a space where you have no choice where you feel trapped in terms yeah. of where you might live your it might be your relationship that you feel trapped yeah. in it yeah. might even be your your job and so that isn't good for anybody feeling trapped and so I I'm with you on the empowerment front where we can take all take more ownership and accountability to create more empowerment and that will give us all more choice and yeah yeah what what a great place to be that with um mm. and i'm sure the listeners are going very evangelical <laughs> and if the work, you know <laughs> yeah but equally i do feel we all we can all play our part and um yeah, yeah, yeah. so exactly. um Neka, your coffee break questions so yeah this is either people's favorite or worst question in fact the last podcast uh, interview I did the the guest said to me I've been thinking about this for weeks and yeah. I still haven't watched a film that they said I should watch by the way but um, <laughs> what's your all-time favorite film and why it's such a hard question um I, I'll can I choose two I'm just going to go, oh, with... go on I'll let you <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you choice <laughs> one is um called waiting to exhale and it's not necessarily very well known but it's basically about these four um friends they're black women Whitney Houston was in it and a few other um Hollywood actresses but I just think it's amazing and beautiful because it shows the the side of life that's challenging but also the beauty in that life and the importance of friendship and sisterhood and that's just a really important thing to me to be able to see women supporting each other through the ups and downs whether it's to do with personal life and love and also professionally and you know going through those challenges of um how others see you but yeah so I that's that's why what I feel like that's a great film um and then the second uh film I would say that I and again it's just a very random film but it just ended up uh I always remember it called nowhere in africa um and i 
study, I've watched it as part of like German A level, so it's the Nürburgring in Africa. Um, and it was just again really beautiful about people moving from one culture, one country to another, adapting within the African environment. I think they were a German couple moving into maybe Kenya. Um, and yeah, the work they were doing, trying to understand local communities, how um, some of that uh, created some friction within their relationship, but actually how they saw that through. And so it was just, it's just a beautiful story. So yeah, those are, those are my two films. I think I may have seen Waiting to Excel uh, quite a few years ago. It's, it's an old, big, old film, It's an yeah. old, yeah. And I loved Whitney Houston when I was um, yeah. growing up. So yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure I might have seen that, but I, yeah. I haven't seen the other film. And also I think, do you know what springs to mind when you start to talk about that is um, I spent some time in Kenya actually when I first left the military and worked with people that for example when we left we gave them lots of mosquito nets some of the basics because they don't have them but I was speaking to somebody who's recently come back from traveling around Africa and Kenya and different uh, parts of that region and they said you know it's really humbling going there because they're happy and the children are out playing with sticks and a tire yeah. and you know they don't have all these things that yeah. you know we tend to have in the, the mm-hmm. rest of our but they're happy and it's that yeah. simplicity going back to your point around friendships and the people around yeah. you you know they're, yeah. they're what hold you up aren't they not yeah the, what really not the phones and the, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly although not that I could live without my iPhone don't no exactly I'm yeah. sure I, I could do with this and then I'm like constantly <laughs> on my phone but yeah <laughs> yeah but that is the world we live in isn't it and it's that yeah. um, and if it wasn't for technology we couldn't be doing this right now exactly um so what's an interesting fact that most people don't know about you I feel like uh, because all these icebreakers now start with name an interesting fact I feel like people some people will know this about me um but um (laughs) I I lived in about five countries when I was growing up before coming uh to the UK so India Nigeria which is where I'm originally from um Paris Caribbean and then when you came to the UK London for a year or two um Ascot for seven years Oxford for four years and then moved to London um for the past 13 years but lots of traveling so um I think I travel a lot for pleasure for work I just love um traveling and um again it comes down to learning and seeing different different sides of the world and the way different ways people live and engage with communities so that yeah so this wasn't in the question pack but I'm sure it's in your your mind anyway but um Based on that, is there anywhere you haven't been yet but you really want to go to? Where, where, if you could go somewhere tomorrow that you haven't been to yet, where, where would it be? I, I feel like I'm torn between saying somewhere like Senegal, um, because as much as I used to go back to Nigeria every year, and I still try to do that um, when we can, and there's no pandemic. Um, I don't think I've explored enough of the other African countries. Um, and I say this because, you know, um, Africa is not a monolith and lots of people see it as, oh, Africa. But I know how different different parts of Nigeria are. I spent some time traveling in South Africa um, and uh, did a safari a couple of years ago. And I just feel like I want to um, spend a bit more time getting to see how other parts of um, other African countries work and engage and so on. So Senegal has come up as a recommendation by quite a few people. Um, recently so that's probably where I'd want to go wow we'll keep an eye out for any of those posts yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you when, when you've been there so what's next then Neka in terms of when you're looking forward where where do you see your your contribution to the change that we've been speaking about but also investing in yourself and your own personal development what are some of the things that you've got on, yeah. on your horizon yeah, I think for me, um, the year before last, I always spend the end of the year sort of reflecting, thinking what's next. Um, and for, in 2022, I achieved something that I had never quite managed to achieve despite trying for about 12 years, which was a better, um, more sustainable lifestyle. And I think that is something that all my friends know this. I always say, oh, I'm starting a new job, new project. New, I'm going to definitely not work crazy hours and and they sort of nod and sort of yeah we're all behind you but see you in a few months yeah exactly (laughs) 
knowing that that's a free snowfall will definitely be calling me. Um, but last year I was able to do that. So I think for me, one of the key things I'm trying to do is maintain that this year and going forward. I think that uh, for various reasons, whether, you know, uh, the narrative for a lot of um, young black children is you have to work twice as hard and you have to always be on top of everything. And I think that's important to demonstrate capability and credibility. You should do that, but you shouldn't have to work twice as hard to have it's it's not a meritocracy the same yeah we're doing exactly. that. so I think that uh, some of those behaviors have sort of embedded and I still take a lot of pride in my work but I think that's one thing that's really important and then alongside that is then really trying to make sure I make a notable difference within the wealth management space and I do this because of that generational wealth gap whether it's it's within the black communities or within the female community I just think it's such an important um an important part of giving back and also seeing the change i'd like to see um in various communities um so that's definitely one thing the wealth management space financial planning and then finally i think it's just continuing to do a lot within um, mentoring and education as well and yes financial education but more broadly speaking education and healthcare because i feel like when you look at underrepresented communities um, and sort of the suffering, the unnecessary suffering I see or the unnecessary um, deprivation. Um, I just feel like that's such a big part um, to give people access to good education, to um, making sure they've got health care that they need. So that's a longer term piece, but it's definitely something that I want to continue to do. So those are sort of um, my, my broader goals, um, but doing that whilst yeah, maintaining some level of balance, hopefully. Yeah. And I think that's a good point, actually, because there's been a lot of talk about work-life balance. And I, yeah. you know, I have my own view on, is there ever really balance? You know, it's that yeah. whole life integration piece and what, what yeah. does that look and feel like? And you, you spending the time doing the things that you want to do, whilst also not being detrimental to the, the yeah. ones that you love around you. And it, it can be a really difficult one but I guess there's the conversation with yourself in terms of if I honestly sit down in a room and take that time and that space just to say okay am I living my best life you know am I doing the things I want to have I got the time how many times do you talk to somebody and say oh I've joined the gym but I don't have time to go or I'd love to do that but I don't have time well if it's really important to you how are you going to make the time to do those things I know when we were speaking a few weeks ago and you were talking about how you really sort of scheduled the time in to take the time for yourself to do the things you want to do I do exactly the same now I never used to do it I meant I used to feel like I couldn't put things in my diary that were not professional now it's yeah I've got my spinning class in my run my gym because they're just as important and if I don't do those things then I lack the financial clarity the the health benefits all those things yeah no every all of that is so important and I I can see it the day I might miss not going to the gym or because I know I've been fanatic um I I will feel that in the way I come across in terms of how I communicate with people um and yes I can still feel tired and it's not like a perfect balance by any means but I know the things that will energize me and the things that will keep me going and yes of course making sure I sleep and have um, a healthy diet and all of those things but knowing that it's never going to be smooth sailing all the time but at least overall the portfolio the ballot the uh where you uh land at the end of it needs to for me at least needs to have a contribution of everything um that uh that's what will keep me going otherwise I'll just, yeah you start to lose clarity around why when something goes wrong it just feels more wrong than it actually is and so on so I think it's um it's really really important yeah I think that's a a a really good point actually around those elements of your your life that you need to concentrate on more than others at different times because you can't put all of your energy into everything at one time but sometimes you need to tweak where you're spending time and I I speak a lot about the three sort of pillars of well-being which are mental health, physical health and financial health. And so financial education, financial well-being is absolutely fundamental to 
all of our lives. Um, it yeah. isn't just for, you know, people with money or people that work with money. Actually, yeah. money is important to every single one of us because whether we like it or not, money is the tool that allows us yeah. to do the things, the good things as well as that, you know, so yeah. healthcare needs money exactly. to provide healthcare, yeah. you know, so it's, yeah, it, rather than say yeah. it's the root of all evil, actually it's that tool that gives us all choice and it depends how how we use it and what we do with it. Therefore, I've loved that conversation. I knew that we would go into lots of, of sort of different avenues. I know there are certain areas that we're, you know, we're really passionate about and we have different experiences, but equally in some ways, you know, I, I feel like we really empathise in terms of some of the challenges that we either face or do face. And I hope that some of the listeners yeah. as well really sort of feel like there are elements that they can take away there and obviously would be really free to to reach out um but yeah. is there anything you'd like to to close with Necker in terms of you know if there was one thing that the listeners could take away from today what what would your golden nugget be um I I don't know if I have a golden nugget I'd say but I think one of the things that um, I try to do is seek inspiration every day in terms of whether it's something I'm reading or um, listening to so I think it's finding what gives you inspiration because life can get quite um, heavy and you know with uh, news that's mostly negative and so on so I try and find something within my day it might be going for a walk that um so I've actually left London this weekend just to um, be in the countryside and so I think it's finding moments of inspiration um, because I feel like if you look for it always within your immediate circle I'm sure everyone has inspiring friends and work colleagues and so on but you won't always find the level of inspiration that you need so I try and like um, yeah engage with different things that will give me that extra uplift so um, I guess the it's not really a golden tip, but it's just, you know, find something that keeps you motivated at various points um, because um, it's not always fair to rely on the people immediately around you to, to do that. So I would, I would definitely spend some time looking for those things. Really great point, Nick. Thank you. And honestly, you are inspirational and I have no doubt that those listening Thanks. will be inspired by, by you and everything that you've achieved. I'm really looking forward to seeing you say as you move forward and then the impact that you, you have in this wealth management space and beyond so thank you Neka, and we'll speak to you again soon no thank you sam and what you're doing is amazing i know you always talk about other people being inspiring but you really are inspiring especially everything that happened last year just your um tenacity and yeah just everything you come to everything with so much joy and enthusiasm so thank you as well mm.